Welcome to the Waterbury Lecture Series. I'm Lindsay Whistle. Penn State alumnus Kenneth Waterbury created an endowment to enhance the university's commitment to the Commonwealth by furthering scholarly excellence in the field of education. As part of that mission, Waterbury Chair Richard Duschel hosts an annual lecture series which features prominent speakers in STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Today's guest is a true pioneer in her field. Dr. Nancy Nersessian is a professor of cognitive science at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Her research focuses on creativity, innovation, and conceptual change in science. We'll talk with her about how scientists think and why it matters, about the importance of creativity, and about her personal sources of motivation. Nancy Narcessian, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna get into your research, but first, um, you, I mean, you really are a pioneer in your field. You're virtually the first person to combine this, this cognition study of science, cognitive study of science, philosophy, and history. Hmm. But I'm curious about how your interest first got peaked, and I know, I think it, it came out of your own sort of negative experiences as a physics student. So my interest in um, understanding creativity in science and the, the processes of science, yeah, really came, came out of that experience. So I was always fascinated with math. That was the thing that really, really attracted me when I was a child. And then I discovered physics, and it was like the universe opened to me. And I was so excited, and I was so passionate. And um, you know, here, here I am, a, a, a high school student, just dying to get into college so I can study physics. And I get into college and I start studying physics and it's boring <laughs> you know, right? the way it was taught. Um, it was mostly, mostly taught to the formulas. And so I was very good at it. I did a great job at it. Um, but it wasn't getting at the questions that I really wanted to ask, which in retrospect now I understand were much more the conceptual questions. What does it mean? What does it really tell us about the world? Not just how do you calculate where the cannonball falls. And um, so uh, I had to uh, make a decision about whether I wanted a Bachelor of Science or a Bachelor of Arts. And I'd already taken a number of literature and language courses, so I decided I'd do the Bachelor of Arts. That required that you take an introduction to philosophy. Which turned and out to I, be quite serendipitous. Yes. <laughs> and I turned out saying, oh my God, I'm not taking that course because that's navel gazing. You know, I was a scientist. but. I had to take it, and the great fortune was that the person who taught it, Milik Chapek, was a specialist in the philosophy of space and time. And instead of teaching the normal introduction to philosophy, he taught an introduction to general relativity, basically the conceptual issues in general relativity. And I thought, this is philosophy? This is what, you know, everyone else in the room could care less about what he was talking about, couldn't care less about what he's talking about. But um, I, I found home. And so then I decided to go to graduate school in philosophy. But when I got to philosophy, too, I found that they were not really asking the kinds of questions that I was interested in at that time. They were mostly asking questions about the language of science and how do we analyze the language of science and understand it from that perspective. And so I started, um, I had a professor there, Howard Stein, who um, told me, well, if you're not happy reading the philosophers, even though he was a philosopher, too, start reading the scientists because the scientists actually have very deep philosophical insights. And so it never occurred to me as a physics student that you could read Maxwell and Einstein and Faraday, but you can. And, and I, I read you said uh, your, I think your life as a scientific researcher really began with Einstein. Right. Yes, it began, it began with wanting to understand the theory of general relativity, but then realizing that I actually wanted to understand how he came up with the theory of relativity. How could anybody come up with something like that? So then that led me in the direction of thinking in, in two things. One, I had to understand the real history of the development. So look at the archival materials, look at the correspondence, not just the pub published works, look at the thinking in general, and then second, trying to understand them as human thinkers, human reasoners. So in what ways does human thinking constrain and afford the kinds of reasoning and thinking that goes on in science? Because it's an outgrowth of ordinary human thinking. So this, this, so physics led you to philosophy, and then that in turn sort of turned on your interest in the history of science mm -hmm. by reading these 
um, these personal notebooks and actually you had I think probably a dream experience for a scientific historian in getting to look through the um, the notebooks of um, Maxwell and Michael Faraday mm -hmm. and um, I'm wondering what what was that like to actually hold those in your hands and to make these sort of discoveries? Well what was really interesting about holding the Faraday things which is where I started I decided I'd go back to where the field concept first comes into physics and it's with Faraday and uh, Faraday's diaries and notebooks had all kinds of sketches and drawings all around the margins. And those sketches and drawings were not really being attended to in the historical literature, and the philosophical literature. They were sort of looked at as, oh, that stuff that's off to the side yeah, and not important. <laughs> but in fact, it struck me that a lot of the reasoning was taking place through those diagrams, through those um, sketches. And so that made me become more interested in trying to think about what role they were playing in the reasoning. But in terms of, in terms of uh, touching, touching the uh, uh, actual documents themselves, I have to say the, the ones I touched the, that made me the most excited was when I was in the Netherlands. Um, I was doing research on the um, Dutch physicist H.A. Lorentz who preceded Einstein and was greatly influential on Einstein. And Einstein and he had a correspondence. And I went into the archives and I picked up Einstein's letters. And Einstein had been my hero since I was a child. And I'm touching the letters that he actually wrote. <laughs> and it was, it was just a tremendous experience. I was so overwhelmed. And there I was supposed to be studying Lorenz. And I was thrilled that I touched something that Albert Einstein had actually touched and written. I'm curious what it is about Einstein. Is it just that that was sort of your first experience with us, or did you feel some some personal connection with him, maybe with how he thought or his his processes? Oh no, no. <laughs> I'm sure I don't think it, any connection with that, um, because I think he was the first scientist I've heard of. I was a kid when he died. And I remembered people talking about him, and somehow he was really, really important. And so I got this idea that I, want to I wanted to understand why he was important, what he had done. Um, and so he was a prime motivator. And, so then, and then this general theory of relativity sounded so mysterious as I got older. So that's why I think Einstein made the big impact, because he was the first scientist, actual scientist, that I had heard about when I was a child. So he was clearly one source of your your own motivation to go into this field, and I, I saw in an interview um, in your your poem piece, as we mm -hmm. talked about earlier, something I thought was very moving. Um, you were speaking about your brother David, and then I, mm -hmm. I read later that you actually keep his. Um, David went to Vietnam at yes. 19, and you keep his um, his Purple Heart by your desk mm -hmm. to motivate you that you had the experience of going to college while well, unfortunately he had the experience of right. going Vietnam as his means to and I'm wondering how much that plays into your drive to keep exploring these issues and to keep to make the most of the opportunity of, of going to college and studying these things. Well I feel like I've been very fortunate I mean I feel like I I mean to have gone to college first of all from the environment in which I came out of um, it was a very impoverished environment and um, and uh, very few people went to college, and I'm the first in my family um, who ever went to college. And um, my brother was going to go to college uh, through the route of going to the military in Vietnam. And um, as I said in the poem, he came back a broken man of 21 and never did go to college. And so, um, yeah, it just reminds me that, you know, there but for fortune go I, you know. Um. As you as you study these these famous scientists of the past and the present, do you find that um, the the personal connections interest you almost as much as the science that they're exploring in terms yeah. of how they think? Does it make an impact? Um, yes, I think it's very important to think about the whole person, the scientist, the sort of the social, cultural environment in which they're raised. Um, the, the, the environment in which they get their education, um, how it impacts them, uh, the passion that they feel. Emotion, affect are very, very important parts of scientific uh, research, scientific processes, because as you know, they're hard. <laughs> they're hard, they're long, they're persistent. But what you get 
particularly when you're looking at the archival materials, and now when I'm actually studying scientists in their research laboratories, is you get this enormous sense of passion and satisfaction that keeps driving them, driving them forward, even when they get enormously frustrated and can go, you know, days, months, years on end. I mean, Einstein spent the last 20 years or so of his life being unproductive, and that he never, he never produced the, the uh, unified field theory that he had intended to do, and yet he kept at it because he had this real focus and passion for it has to be this way and I'm going to figure it out. Yeah, I'm wondering about the, the, the personal experience because I, I this was the best way I heard it explained when you were talking about your research in, into modeling and experimental thinking. I was thinking mm -hmm. about, for example, fixing a car or trying to move furniture mm -hmm. through a door, so I'm wondering how experiences through life shape the ability to look at things in a new, critical, creative way, and also how it differs from a scientific perspective if a scientist is looking at a problem to a lay person trying to get a chair through a door. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we all have the fundamental capacities, the cognitive capacities that scientists have. And we use them we use them in different ways and when we're trying to figure out creative solutions in everyday life. So one of the capacities is called mental modeling. Um, that is we're able to envision a system or envision a phenomenon or envision the process that we're trying to understand to a rudimentary extent. Of course, we don't have pictures in our mind that are fully detailed. Um, but, uh, and this is rooted in our evolutionary history. The ability to foresee the environment would have been very, very important evolutionarily for us. And so when we're trying to figure out a problem, um, we often c construct some kind of model in our mind if we have to simulate the phenomenon. So how do you get a chair through a door? You often don't get your measuring stick out. You, you use that as a last resort when you finally, finally have run it through your imagination, the various configurations that you can do, and you discover that none of those work. Then you'll get out the measuring rod, but usually they have worked already. I think it's interesting. There's always that saying that um, uh, no great mi or t you know two minds think alike and I'm wondering if scientists think alike if there are these common patterns or if you notice across the spectrum based on maybe the particular focus of their studies or their particular personalities are there common themes or is it is it every mind is, has its own method of working through these things no I think there's a great deal of com commonality which is why you can have a cognitive science of science so yes, I mean, everyone brings different kinds of facets to, to what it is that they do. They bring their experiences, they bring their different educational processes. So for example, I, uh, Maxwell brought the mathematics that he had been learning and developing when he was at Cambridge working on continuum mechanics. Faraday knew nothing mathematically. He was a qualitative thinker, a qualitative reasoner. And um, so they, brought, they both brought something different to thinking about the field processes, but each of them, I, from the analyses that I've done, you can reconstruct that each of them are constructing models, they're constructing visual models, analogies, they're doing thought experiments, thought simulations, and these characteristics, that's what, that's what got me interested in these characteristics, is these characteristics, you can trace them back to the beginnings of science, Galileo, Newton, all the way through to contemporary scientists in their research laboratories or the ones that are working in their offices on theoretical problems. I'm curious how this relates going back to your initial interest coming from a, a poorly taught physics class. What, what impact will this have on science education at all levels? So one of my ma mantras has become scientists should preach what they practice. Um, and so what happens, first of all, for scientists, their practices, what they do every day and how they do it, are largely become tacit, that is, they become just intuitive, that, that they don't think about them, they don't reflect on them. Um, they, f they focus when they're teaching, by and large, they have been focusing or were focusing, things have been changing, we've actually been having some impact, um, but they largely focus on equations. So 
finding the equations, showing the students how to do the mathematics, showing them how to do the formulas, but not thinking that all the kind of what they call back of the envelope calculations and the sketching and drawing and figuring out things like those, uh, those diagrams around the margins of, of Faraday's notebooks, um, they don't think that those things are part of actually the scientific process and of learning about science as well. So what we've been able to do is to get scientists and get teachers interested in these kinds of modeling practices and thinking that these should somehow be incorporated into the way in which we teach. And that makes, makes it a lot easier to understand conceptually. It leads the students through the kinds of practices that scientists actually go through before they ever get to a formula. I think in addition to just the the teaching method, I would think that would almost be comforting to students who maybe look at, at scientists as, as these innate geniuses who just have all the answers and actually knowing that they can use the similar process to work through their own problems maybe on a different scale would be quite encouraging. Yeah, I mean to say that you're tapping into things that students might do quite naturally in other environments is, is I think really important for them to understand that the scientific process isn't all about the mathematics, but of course you have to get to the mathematics in the end. And, and another thing I think is interesting is uh, stating the obvious, you are a woman in the sciences and uh, when you look at women in science, women make up half the job market almost, but less than 25 percent of STEM professions. And a lot of people think that this starts when you're a young girl and you don't have role models to look at, you don't have this encouragement that you're able to do it and I'm wondering did you come up did you come across that in your own experience and, and obviously Einstein was a role model but did you yeah. have any women who you could look to? No. <laughs> Actually no. So what was interesting for me is that I think because I was really good in math again coming back to math my teachers took a great interest in me when I was in elementary school. So, and I had male teachers for the last two years of elementary school, actually, who really appreciated that and, you know, so made me think the math was special and I was special because I could do the math. And then all through high school, the same thing, the math and the science. I was very, very good at that. And I think in the Boston Public Schools, they were just happy to have somebody who was really good at math and science. And so it never occurred to me that there was any problem and it never occurred to me that women don't do this kind of thing, even though my teachers, who were so wonderful, encouraging, and supportive, were by and large not women um, in, the, in, in the science fields. And then when I got into college, I was really surprised to find out, you know, there were so few girls and women in, in my classes. And then by the time I was a junior, I was the only woman in the physics uh, program, uh, getting, getting my degree in physics. And when I went into philosophy, I experienced the same thing. Um, and I began to become aware that this was a problem, uh, basically when I was in graduate school, and then after that, um, you know, in, in, the, in the profession. And you would have a better idea than anyone, this long-standing myth that the female mind is not suited to work through these types of problems. I mean, you, 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 you've worked through how the mind thinks, so I'm wondering, is there any truth in that, or is it? Uh, right. No way, okay? There is no cognitive research to substantiate that women are any less capable of doing the kinds of abstract thinking that goes into science. Um, absolutely none. I was reading too that the um, the lack of belief in your ability can actually itself cause you to not learn as well. So I think that's probably yeah. very encouraging. Yeah, well, I think that's the problem. I think the thing is is that they show that particularly a young adolescent women, girls, start to not believe that they can do it. And so maybe the thing with myself was that my teachers just kept thinking, believing I could do it, and so I kept on believing I could do it too. I'm also curious, you've studied a lot, um, obviously, many different countries about the cognition, and, and you yourself are of uh, Armenian heritage. What mm. role do you think culture has in the way people think about science and the way they work through problems? Is it a universal method, or does it change based on the situation in which you grew up? Well, I think, you know, as with any, everything, there's variation. 
and there are cultural differences and cultural styles, and there's been a lot of historical research on that and sociological research on, on different styles. Um, so, for example, there's a, a very good book by Sharon Trowick, and it's called Beam Times and Lifetimes, and she studies particle physicists in America and particle physicists in Japan. Now, with respect to the ways in which they think and you know the kinds of reasoning processes that I'm interested in. No, you really don't see you don't see differences there, but you do see differences in the way they go about their practice. So, for example, uh, science in the United States has tended to be rather individualistic. Even if it's done with groups of people, everybody's an individual. Everybody makes their own contribution. Whereas in Japan, the science tended to be much more collective. Um, so it's those kinds of differences, much more sort of sociocultural than in the actual processes of scientific thinking. And I think it's um, it's interesting to note those those challenges, and that you don't usually, well, most people I think don't associate sort of writer's block with scientists or scientific thinking. And I'm wondering what are some of those other impediments, other than the cultural situations or, or the education systems that might hinder creativity in, in, a, in a lab or in a, in a study? Hmm, that's a hard one. Uh, so, of course, one of the things that scientists have to deal with all the time is failure. And I think that that's not widely recognized outside of science. That it, what's really interesting, I mean, when you're looking at historical records, you still see traces of failure, but you don't see as much as you do when you're looking at live science, when you're looking at scientists in their daily research. And they fail 90% of the time at what they're trying to do. Um, and you ha what's important is to cultivate resilience. How, one does, how does one cultivate resilience in the face of failure? How does one keep them going on, realizing that, by and large, it's not a personal failure. It's the subject matter. It's the difficulty of what it is that you have to do. And so um, I think f attending, like we, we do in the uh, university program that we've developed in biomedical engineering, we develop all kinds of support structures. Because we see in the laboratories, they have evolved all kinds of support structures to make people realize that the failure is not personal. The failure is part of the scientific process. And it's part of the creative process as well. I think. Um I don't want to equate it with failure, but I, I think you had some struggles early on because of your unique merging of these three facets. And I, I, if I understand correctly, you had some struggles even even finding a, an, a position because your thinking was apparently more creative than a, than a lot of people um, in the field in terms of combining these three seemingly different things. Well, I'm not sure if it was more creative, but, but it was definitely different. Oh, open-minded, um, maybe that's a better Interdisciplinary. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. open-minded and interdisciplinary. One of the problems is, is that, you know, everybody says interdisciplinary is the way to go. Interdisciplinary is the source of creativity, and that's why I study interdisciplinary research now, too, because I believe that as well. It's the source of creativity. But the, the kinds of disciplinary structures and structures that we have at the university still impede interdisciplinarity in terms of being able to find positions. So yeah, I mean, I wandered the universe for 18 years with lots of publications and lots of uh, notice and, and attention without really being able to get a tenured job. Um, but I was very stubborn. <laughs> so. so you made it happen? Yes. Um, I want to kind of segue into a little bit more specifics um, of your research. Um, and I'm thinking, I, I, I've, I browsed several of them, but I, uh, a professor at UC Berkeley called your, your book, um, Creating Scientific Co Concepts, a tour de force by a creative cognitive science scientist of science. And I'm wondering, that particular um, book, what, what motivated you and what were you hoping to get out of it? And did it, did it obviously made an impact? Was it the impact you were hoping for? Yes, well, I had been working on those problems, of course, for a very long time. And I had written other things, and I had written other books, but that book I just kept working on on the side, you know, for, for, for a very long time, thinking, I want to pull it all together. How can I pull it all together? Trying to find the concentration and trying to be able to, 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 to get it done. And there were times in which I was, wasn't going to get it done either. <laughs> right? So I'm very glad I got it done because no matter how many articles and pieces you write separately, it's when you bring it all together 
that it makes an impact. And so um, I was really very pleased to have people like George Lakoff make the, make, make the comment that they made. And also to say, for have, to have him as a cognitive scientist say, the cognitive science of science, because that wasn't a field that existed. And it was a field that I, with a, with a handful of other people, have been trying to work on and develop. Um, because if you want to develop a cognitive science, that is you know, a, a cognitive science of human thinking, you have to look at the spectrum, and a lot of attention is given to development, because a, there's a lot of stuff going on with kids in, in terms of cognitive development. But science is one of the most creative expressions of cognition um, that we have, and the cognition of scientists and, and, and artists, et cetera, need to be considered into the accounts that we develop of what is human cognition. So the, that was one of the most exciting things, is to have him and also another, another one who um, reviewed my book, cognitive science, major cognitive scientist, say this is the cognitive science of science. So this really is a, a field of the future in a way. Where, do you see it growing? Do you see it, it expanding? Do you see it changing? Well, I hope it's going to grow and expand. <laughs> Um, certainly, it's got a lot of credibility now, I think, which is good because, um, again, it has to be done in a different way. It has to be done in a way that involves a lot of historical analysis, that involves a lot of observational studies. Um, so it's not, you know, science on the model of physics science. And it's taken a while for it to get credibility and to say that you can actually learn something about cognition from looking at historical records, for example. Um, so yes, I think I think it's a it's a it's a area that's uh, put, has ripe for potential, ripe for growth, um, also in its interaction with science education, um, because it's interested in the cognition of science. It has particular relevance for thinking about learning and how we go about teaching um, uh, science scientific fields in a way that is cognitively informed, and so I think that there's a lot of opportunities there. But um, I won't downplay that it would be hard for young people because they have to really be, be willing to not only learn, say, the cognitive science that they need to learn in order to do this kind of research, but also learn and know something about the science itself and the content of the science. And the history of science. And the history of science, yes. And that, that's something I have to say, I, I don't remember my experience in school learning too much about, about the scientists themselves and about their thought processes, and mm -hmm. I think Personally, that would have made a huge difference in my level of interest. Yes, it would have. It would have for me too. I mean, of course, I continued to be interested in it, obviously. But um, had I really had the opportunity uh, to learn about how these scientists think uh, when I was much younger, I think I would have perhaps had an easier time trying to do the science myself. Maybe I still I would have been a theoretical physicist. <laughs> well, and maybe in the way they think is not so different in the way you or I would think. It's just right. they, they, I think they take it one, maybe that one step further where they go back and think about the way they think. Yeah, that's very important aspect about scientific thinking is this what we call metacognition, the reflection, conscious explicit reflection on the development of knowledge on the kinds of questions you're asking, on the evidence you're producing and its relationship to the uh, problems that, that you're addressing. We don't do that naturally. It really has to be taught. And we, we talked a little about your struggle in terms of getting the field of cognitive science kind of off the ground, but I read that you said the feeling that of satisfaction that comes from completing a struggle like that or seeing it through is, is the best feeling for you. And I'm wondering what um, what struggle or what challenge are you dealing with now, or is there one you're, you're hoping to take on in the future? Well, uh, yeah, I, I've sort of, you know, I feel like I daily struggle. <laughs> so I'm always trying to understand these very complex phenomena. And um, it's very, very difficult to work through, to sustain the effort um, to, to write things up. I mean, my students, I tell them, I tell my graduate students, I still have problems in writing. You know, you sit there and you agonize and agonize and agonize over how to formulate something. And, but then, that's what I meant by the elation, when you say, ah, okay, now I've got it, it's formulated, you forget about all the rest of it. And um, one thing I actually, I wanted to bring this up earlier when we were talking about creativity and science. 
you, in addition to being this pioneering scientist, are also an accomplished opera singer, and I'm wondering, where did that come from? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, all I know is from my earliest memories as well, um, uh, I sang. I always sang. I loved to sing. Um, and when I was in college early, uh, early years of college, I encountered opera, and for some reason I felt, oh, I could do that. I would like to do that. <laughs> So I started studying, um, and um, I uh, found that, that, that uh, actually I could. Um, I'm a contralto and dramatic mezzo-soprano, um, and it's a, been a wonderful outlet to have in parallel to that intense sitting down at your desk and thinking, 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 and writing, 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 and then you can actually get up and uh, perform and be with a group of people and, uh, and uh, tap into some different aspects of yourself. And you say that you, you don't actually believe in, in, or at least personally, in the concept of right brain and, and left brain. It's right. just this, this <laughs> the synthesis of, of all aspects of yourself and I'm wondering if that if you've seen that in some of the scientists you've studied if that is important to have this artistic vent to kind of keep the the creative thinking flowing. So many of them have an artistic dimension to their lives. I mean my my hero Einstein played the violin. Um, that was very well known. Um, many scientists and mathematicians are, are musicians. Um, Maxwell loved to write poetry um, and uh, so, so yeah, I think that uh, there seems to be a uh, correspondence between scientific uh, creativity and uh, artistic creativity as well. And I think that it taps into some of the same abilities too. I mean, you know, one has to construct a model of what one's doing, for example, when one's learning techniques. I'm wondering if we'll ever get to a day where in a science class, um, music or poetry or, or sketching or painting is actually incorporated in, in the teaching methodology. That would be terrific. <laughs> um, we're, we're just about out of time, but I, I want to ask one, one final question. Um, and you, you touched on this earlier. You said the best piece of advice you ever received was um, from one of your professors, Howard Stein, um, uh, an emeritus professor um, at University of Chicago, and he told you not just to read the philosophers, but to read the scientists. I'm wondering, what piece of advice would you give to aspiring scientists at any level? Well, the advice that I give to my own students is to follow your problems, to be problem driven, that is to have real problems that will sustain you through all the hardships, and then have the courage to follow them where they take you. They may take you into different domains, they may require that you learn different things from what you start out thinking that you're going to do, but that will sustain your passion and that will enable you in the end to do something creative. Dr. Nancy Narcessian, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. To view Nancy's lecture, Fostering Creativity in Interdisciplinary Learning Spaces, visit the Waterbury Lecture Series website. I'm Lindsay Whistle. From all of us here at Penn State, thanks for watching.